Welcome back everybody today, it's really going to be fun because we now have to deal with the fallout of the Unity situation. We have had developers across the industry speaking out about this. Um, I've had people that I know have, you know, that their, their own whatever experiences. There's publishers who are, let's just say, if you are in any form of like developer or uh, publisher relations at Unity, you've probably had a very, very, very busy day at work. A lot of publishers have been reaching out some pretty damn serious calls. And from what I have been led to understand thus far, not a whole lot of progress. The people who are working at Unity essentially seem to have their hands tied with no clear answers that they can provide. It overall seems that they, they don't even seem to know how this entire shindig is even going to be implemented. So it's a pretty crazy situation. It is, however, one that Unity have uh, responded to, which absolutely is very fun. And of course, in the spirit of dealing with these runtime fees, Here's a word from our sponsor, Boot Dev. Their founders are actually a bunch of WoW players who found our channels. And with code Bellular News, you'll get 25% off. And you're going to want that because Boot.dev is a programming RPG that makes learning backend development fun. They've got quests, levels, achievements, a global leaderboard. They've designed your like journey through learning so well. Now, backend developers in the US, by the way, earn a hundred grand as of 2022. And that's just the median. That's a lot of money. And you can also often get remote or hybrid work. Now, Boot Dev specializes in backend development using Python and Go at your own pace, which is an excellent choice. With them, you can avoid tutorial hell, just, you know, ping pong around the place. And you can just go to boot and get started coding. Go through their course. It's exactly what their fantastic program is geared towards. Just going through the various topics, there is a boatload of content structured super well, starting actually good and approachable, and then going properly in depth. So instead of bouncing around a bunch of YouTube tutorials or a boring old textbook, well, with boot, you can just ship code that works. It's the complete opposite to the wrong way of doing things. And as a computer science major, God damn, I wish they existed back when I was in university because they sure do beat a semester or a few. And uh, well, they don't cost as much as my university charged me. <laughs> so check them out. You'll earn skills that have got significant earning potential. And honestly, are just really cool. I'm chipping away personally learning for fun. You can do the same and learn how to code with 25% off using code Bellular News. Big thanks to their founders, Lane and Allen, for supporting what we're doing here. With that said, let's roll. Well, that sure was the most slick sponsor segue I've had in a while, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so let's dive into the story then. Have a read of this. Wow, my source at Unity just told me they had a company town hall meeting. It lasted only 30 seconds. Riccatello came on, announced there had been threats against Unity HQ, and they were evacuating offices in San Francisco and Austin, and then they signed off. I hope everyone's okay. So, one of those things, these uh, can turn into crazy situations. Now, you may by default think, yeah, as if that's real. The tricky thing is, though, even though the chance is probably 98% that it is a bogus threat, even if it seems credible or, you know, they happen to know something, um, even if it's a 98% chance, you still cannot take that risk. You cannot be the person who just said, ah, it's nothing, it's just bullshit from 4chan. And uh, then it maybe turns out, oh, it wasn't bullshit from 4chan, right? So it's the sort of thing they have to act in this way in a situation like that. It, uh, it just is what it is, right? So that happened, which is pretty crazy. And at the very least, for the staff at Unity, who have had all of this thrust upon them, even more stress to what is probably quite a hellscape, as uh, from what we understand, a lot of Unity staff have been raising the alarm bells about how this is just not a particularly uh, great way of doing things for a while. But okay, let's talk about some, uh, some firefighting, because Unity have been on a firefighting mode, both as a corporate entity and also as individual staff. Uh, the latter, though, don't really seem to have been fully prepped for how much pushback there would be, and I say that because really there is nothing the way of concrete answers. And uh, suffice to say, some people will get rather leaky soon, and uh, we'll get to read that. Okay, here's Nick, studio head of Agro Crab Games. They've developed and published a few games. They've got one coming out in 2023. Just got off a call with Unity. The reps were nice folks, but ultimately didn't say anything that gives us confidence 
this company is to be trusted. A lot of their answer is boiled down to, you can work it out with your account manager to iron things out. Man, I just want a clear policy. Uh, yeah, you would think they'd be ready to give clarity whenever they are fundamentally going to be changing the unit economics of your business, which is mad. So, uh, continually, Unity have not really been able to do things. I know, um, you know, both like public stuff and also private stuff of um, like many publishers who are now um, having talks with their Unity reps and are not particularly pleased. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's going on now. Unity did release a official statement. To be honest, it's a whole load of nothing. So um, I'll give you our more summarized down short bit. So they uh, start with the fact that uh, customers were suffering from confusion and frustration, which is awful. You did this though. 90% of customers won't be affected by this, they say, but 10% will be subject to fees that they never agreed or planned for. Because again, you're saying, hey, your unit, unit economics in two or three months, they'll be different. Have a nice day. Yeah, that doesn't seem like the sort of thing uh, that should be going on, at least in a business like this. This is different from just like Netflix is saying, hey, we're gonna charge you two quid more a month for our service. Like in B2B, stuff does not work that way. Um, I mean, obviously price rises can happen, but uh, you know, there is a more of a dialogue because you have a lower volume of customers and uh, well, customer care, uh, you know, the stability of businesses, especially if you're essentially a form of like utility provider, um, that stuff is extremely important. Now, the way they say here, the 90% of customers won't be affected by this. You see, um, one thing that uh, a lot of people don't fully appreciate is survivorship bias in games. As an example, our game, The Pale Beyond, um, uh, via some numbers I saw, like average Steam sales data, um, we're in like the top 85% or something like that. Um, and that's crazy to me or, you know, 85th percentile, um, or maybe it was 90th, but it was, like, pretty high. Now, the thing is, I'm not swimming in money. I have some funding, you know, worked out, like, for our next title and stuff, but that is um, not Pale Beyond Revenue that's funding that. That is me and, uh, you know, my business partner finding, you know, finding ways of raising the funds. It's, like, that sort of thing. If they say, like, only 10% of our customers, uh, you know, will, will be impacted by this. Like, the people who are running businesses are are that, like, 10%, right? Uh, so it's, I don't know, it's it's kind of crazy. Like, there's so many more people use Unity than uh, pay for Unity. Same goes for Unreal. Um, just because of the way that these, um, the way that these tools work. Kind of weird. Like, you could say that Unreal, though, uh, they're able to subsidize their technology group because, uh, you know, Fortnite and all the other things that Unreal are doing. But anyway, um, I suppose one big thing there, Epic Games... Uh, privately held, Tim Sweeney, majority shareholder. Unity Technologies went uh, went public a few years ago. And funny enough, it's mostly went downhill since then. But anyway, let us continue. They say the fees will be on new installs only, but of course you will have to pay for people installing your game, and you did not have to pay for people installing your game before. Uh, now, the way that this essentially works, like their whole framing initially was that, hey, as Unity, we have two things. Thing number one is the runtime. Thing number two is the editor. And via your Unity subscription, you're paying for the editor, but you're not paying for the runtime, which is, uh, suffice to say, a very loopy way um, of, uh, yes, of, of working things out. Um, then there's also how do installs count here. Uh, reinstalls, fraud, demos, uh, web games, charity stuff won't count, but they provide no clear way of how they are going to identify. Like, oh, that key was from a Humble Bundle. That key wasn't from a, hum a Humble Bundle. Also, Humble Bundle, some of that goes to charity, some of it goes to the developer. Where's the line? Because, like, that could be exploited against Unity, so they do have an incentive, because if people were just like, yeah, it's a Humble Bundle, you know, give, give a tiny percent or as small as you can uh, to the charity, the rest of the developer, then, you know, Unity's going to be very angry. It's like, oh, you're using charity as a technicality. We're going to bill you. You know, we don't really know. And basically, none of this is new, right? This is just a bunch of clarifications and things that were posted, like, by some employees, codified into one place. Nothing has been walked back in this that was distributed as a paid advertisement on X.com. Isn't that fantastic? Um, as Mike Bithel quite well put it, I would like to acknowledge uh, any confusion and frustration anyone has felt as a direct result of reading and understanding my publicly stated position. I will be providing no further comment at this time. Uh, now, we do not have explanations for how platforms will be paying as distributors, and this is a fairly goddamn major thing in the, uh, in the funding ecosystem of indie games. 
Um, now, it doesn't apply to us. We have not got first party deals. I'll give you an example of what a first party deal uh, very, uh, you know, I could say quite informed reasonably could look like, right? So that could be like 300 grand, 400 grand, 500 grand. It all obviously depends on uh, the style of your game, like how big the game is, um, you know, how many, uh, you know, users perhaps Microsoft or, uh, you know, Sony would uh, think it would run, right? But whatever, let's just say it's, uh, you know, 300 grand. That's going on to say Game Pass and Game Pass has got like, what, 22 million users. Um, I know like original PS Plus has got many more millions, but let's just use like Game Pass because, you know, everyone on Game Pass is slurping down all the video games. Well, now if that is just charged, um, you know, whatever the rate is per install, Microsoft is now thinking, okay, so we're going to pay X amount of money for uh, for the game because sometimes Microsoft will, uh, you know, they'll sign a deal to bring a game over to their platform or maybe they will sign a deal earlier on to support development, right? And that can be extremely useful for um, for many developers. I suppose whenever Epic was doing exclusive, it also, you know, exclusives, it kind of worked out like that too. Um, but the way that this messes up the funding ecosystem then is Microsoft's thinking, okay, cool, we give 300 grand to you. We then have the game as a free download for millions and mi like, you know, 20, 22, 23 million people. How many of them will download and how much will we be charged for download for each download? Now, for Microsoft, you know, in an absolute case, it won't be a tremendous amount of money, but uh, it could actually start to compete for what they paid for the game in the first place. That's going to change the economics. That is not going to be good for uh, something that is certainly helping many indie studios actually exist, uh, especially in a world where, um, you know, look like we're pretty lucky. I can, I, you know, there's an audience here. Um, I can say, hey, support us, you know, buy the Pale Beyond, check the game out. And, uh, you know, people do that. It helps with the sales. But not everybody's got that. And for them, something like Game Pass is a literal complete lifeline. Um, so that this could then really disrupt uh, that side of the funding and, you know, how the industry is right now. That could be quite damaging. Now, as I move on then, whether or not this policy will be adjusted, how much warning will customers get about any adjustments in the future? We don't know. How will this be audited? Because developers seemingly cannot be shown what is, uh, you know, the various different, you know, the, the numerical breakdown of what's leading to their bill. And now this is where things get very interesting. So number one, uh, this just appeared in, um, in our sales email today. Uh, well, I think it was yesterday, but anyway, now here's the deal. I've not been able to like um, verify this uh, so far, but what is here does kind of corroborate what is over here. But it's look, I, this isn't one of those situations where I can say I have a source at Unity. Ideally, what you'd want to say is I have two or three sources at Unity in different departments that are independently corroborating a thing. Like for, you know, proper capital J journalism, that that is the standard, right? So um, I am purposefully trying to flag it and make it very clear that um, this is an interesting image that looks like a screenshot of uh, Slack, but I cannot verify that thus far. It does seem to corroborate uh, what is said in this post on the Unity forums. So this is from a user called Incredulous who joined yesterday with one post. Um, but they're claiming that they're a current Unity employee. I feel compelled to post something because I'm appalled at the initial choices for how this uh, pricing model is being done. And more impo most importantly, the poor and confusing uh, communications around it. And it's been a very bad uh, 12 plus hours for the people over at Unity. Now, there is a good explanation here, and this does actually cut to a problem. Unity needs to generate more revenue to eventually be a profitable company so that we can sustain developing Unity for many years to come. Employees need to be paid or there's no engine. It's as simple as that. There's some cold hard facts here. And uh, in the similar way, the unit economics of Spotify are so bad that they've really been going hard on podcasts because they need more things. Spotify's got a crazy issue where the more you use Spotify, the less profitable you are because um, of how the, basically it doesn't seem like it's a kind of, you know, like rev share. Uh, no, it's more like, uh, you know, remuneration per pay. So um, that's actually yeah, Spotify's model's terrible. They've had to diversify into other things. You then look at Unity and you're like, why is Unity talking so much about like architectural, um, you know, just so many other use cases, virtual production, et cetera, et cetera. And it's because they need to expand out to other things because they're struggling to get the core games business to actually work for them. And they certainly do have a problem here because number one, they're a public company. 
they now have new sets of incentives that Epic Games doesn't have. Epic Games also, and I say Epic because it is their main competitor, and yes, I know, like, as an example, Godot is out there, and we'll talk about Godot in a little bit. You know, Epic have got Fortnite. They have other ways to bring in a hell of a lot of money. They have lines of business that Unity don't have, and also they're privately held, which probably helps. Uh, now, the way that Epic is, is, you know, 5% uh, of revenue, then with Unity, it's the per seat revenue. Um, I think, you know, about, like, $1,800 a year a seat on the pro plan which um, after a certain amount of revenue, well, uh, there's one bracket, you go past that revenue, then you have to have the plus plan. They're actually eliminating the plus plan. And then the next uh, revenue bracket, you've got to go for the pro plan, like for all the seats in your organization. So basically Unity is a subscription, but it is actually royalty free. Um, and I suppose that's the interesting thing here. Depending on the unit economics of your game, paying per install could be cheaper than the royalty based model, right? So you could see how that could be actually a good thing for some game developers. But very obviously, this is just being targeted at mobile, especially the incentives to use the Unity um, ad platform and essentially to get credits and, uh, you know, like the, the first party stuff. It's not exactly as aimed at, uh, I think, a lot of the parts of the industry, like big premium games um, that are actually talking about this. Uh, they say many very profitable game studios pay very little to Unity compared to other costs in their business, despite the Unity engine being a essential part of the gamer product. This uh, is aimed at the 10% of customers as a way to scale their costs, um, you know, with success via revenue and installs. One of those tricky things, right? If it was a, you know, 5% style thing, maybe they wouldn't be in a position like this. So this person goes on to explain that, yes, this is targeted at the 10% of customers uh, that, you know, are actually making a lot of money, right? Um, but I also do admit that there is a will to bring more users over to the Unity Pro uh, subscription because, uh, well, you know, more revenue, right? And it's one of those tricky things. Like, yes, the more something is completely free, they do have to make their money somehow. They've tried to do that with the ads platform. Uh, of course, though, there's uh, there's been a lot of things uh, rocking the advertisement industry uh, lately, but to get onto some more of the real spicy stuff. Uh, so this person talks about installs, right? Installs are meant to be unique uh, per unique user. Uh, CI tests, other automations won't be charged. They don't want to charge for fraudulent installs. So I'm very glad that they don't want to. That sets my heart at ease. Um, there will not be an embedded phone home mechanism, which then makes you think, hmm, how will they calculate this? Point five, Unity hasn't actually completely figured out how to count installs yet. Whatever the solution is, it will be conservative. It will potentially slash probably undercount installs, but definitely will not overcount. They will not charge for charities, for subscription services. They will talk to a subscription services distributor, not the game creator. There will be an online calculator to model your potential costs soon. And uh, they do say that yes, in this current form, it's possible for successful games with very high install counts and low enough per install install revenue to, uh, yeah, lose money when people install their game. And uh, when this was raised internally, apparently the answer they got was, we would fix this with the customer um, to not bankrupt them. Which again, I am sure will feel great. You know, it's, uh, that's not a clear policy. That is a, you know, talk to us and we'll see how it goes. And then you wonder, like, will everybody be able to access uh, that equally? Now, I've seen examples of people who would be screwed over by this. There's a dev here who is saying um, that high install, low revenue per user games get taxed proportionately more. I ran a game with over 150 million installs, a four to seven cents ARPU. Uh, this would have 25 to 50% of my revenue stolen by Unity now. So that's very cool. I saw another example of people who are Basically, that they're in a similar situation because they're not running ads. It's just some sort of like optional in-app thing because their app is targeting a younger audience and they don't want to do certain things on it. And basically how the Unity change would just wipe them out. Now, according to this, Unity will just talk to them and waive the fees, I guess, but, or, you know, reduce them somehow. But man, uh, none of this seems to be trustworthy. Then um, there is this, which uh, seemingly is like a Slack, um, like a Slack uh, screenshot that was sent to me. And um, basically, uh, the core thing here, it is actually the underlying stuff. Please know that we have a team focused on building solid solutions for it. This is about, uh, you know, how they're actually going to technically implement the counting of installs. As an FYI, my team is heavily involved with the creation of a runtime install counter and added invoicing layer to support our newly introduced runtime fee. This will take a substantial focus as of now until at least end of year. Remember, they want to turn this on the start of 2024. 
January 1st, um, and likely also in 2024. As a consequence, other asks will be down prioritized. So, I can't confirm that, but things seem to line up, and it's certainly, if things like this are flying around, I definitely want more clarity in this issue. So, I really wonder, how are they even going to be able to give us clarity when they seemingly don't even have the technological side of this figured out, right? This is why it all seems very, very, very bizarre to me. So I suppose at the end of the day, like this is all just C-suite push. Will they relent? Will they not? When will it be rolled back? That's that's the thing. How can they uh, weather this media storm? And well, that funnily enough is where we get to another spicy change because they've already made efforts to suggest there is no way out for developers. They have retroactively updated their terms of service service and, you know, license um, that uh, Unreal Engine style locks you into the license that you signed on with. And that means the developers cannot rely upon that, or they can perhaps choose some sort of costly legal battle to, uh, you know, get a confirmation on whether it works, which is very cool. So companies making uh, Unity games, I think especially in mobile, have a think about like Mihoyoverse games like Genshin Impact, uh, they will simply be directed towards the higher tier subscriptions for better discounts or, you know, like the, the credit system by integrating Unity ads uh, into how they do things. Now, as Simon Carlos basically explains, um, again, Game Discover Co. newsletter, really good newsletter, I would recommend. Traditional game development isn't that much of a, a big deal for the company. It's a, you know, this is a small imitation of a much bigger structure. Let's get into this. Unity wants a semi-trackable solution for better monetizing its top, mainly mobile customers. So, how do you approach this? Although a percentage of developer revenue is more logical for engine licensing, as Unreal's uh, 5% gross over 1 million fee is, it works completely on the honors system. Epic has no way of knowing your revenue, but download numbers can be tracked. That's how this started. The PC console engine business is surprisingly unimportant fiscally to Unity. Looking at their uh, latest quarterly financials, Create Solutions, the engine division, was $193 million compared to Grow Solutions, the mobile ads um, side of things and you know, other things, uh, that's uh, $340 million. Industries beyond games represent 30% of the total Create Solutions revenue. So engine revenue for games is only 23% of Unity's revenue. PC console is presumably half or less than that, which is uh, it's not that much. Um, of course, you do have uh, the, the whole post-COVID situation, right? Uh, do you remember how stocks went to insane values uh, during like all the lockdowns? And people are just like, wow, I guess this transient period of change that will likely end in a year or two. I guess that means the fundamental value of this company's went up. And then everyone gets surprised whenever Meta tanks, uh, I think it tanked that went back up, but you know, like when Netflix and all these companies kind of fall back down again, people realize, oh, suddenly Zoom is not the most important tech company ever. Ah. And when you get to the numbers here, it's hilarious because their share price, which topped out at $196 a share in November, 2021, is now 36 bucks and dropping, aided by um, ATT charges on mobile platforms. It still has a market cap of 14 billion, but there's a lot of pressure for it to reach this bizarre thing that is called actual profitability. Engine fees are therefore an obvious angle of attack. One of the situations that so many of these very growth-based companies, uh, you know, get in, it's like, yeah, you're growing, you're becoming a very important part of these industries, but um, how are your basic economics doing there, Buster? That's the issue. Uh, so the tricky thing here is that they've got themselves into a situation where developers are pretty much not going to accept anything other than uh, no for this, essentially, right? But Unity doesn't have a material need to change back because we're not that important. As you can see by the numbers, we're not where the money's coming from. So that leads us in a strange place. Here's somebody, uh, Troy. Uh, I worked on a early, very different iteration of the Unity pricing changes one year ago. My thoughts. One, Unity strategically had no choice but to make changes. Two, devs are upset, but it isn't quite as bad as it seems. I suppose if it's that thing, if you're making like over a million, uh, you know, a million dollars on a high revenue per user game title, such as a premium PC or console game. Uh, if you're doing that, like this will be cheaper than the Unreal Engine licensing fee that you'll be paying um, above a million gross. 
Uh, I think for developers though, it's just like the implementation of this and the issues that it's going to have. I think the reason why indie devs are particularly uh, worried about this is uh, like the impacts on say like a Game Pass deal that um, lots of downloads could change the economics for Microsoft or Sony to the degree where maybe they're not wanting you to be downloaded a bunch on their platform and they're not wanting to pay for that. So that's one of the reasons. And as well, just generally, there's been a lot of negative sentiment towards uh, Unity. Honestly, for ages now. <sighs> Slowing of innovation, it becoming extremely clear that while Unity started off as a games engine, that we are absolutely no longer the priority. Um, so... Uh, thoughts in Unity have been going down for a while. I think this is a very large expression of that. Um, so according to an ex-developer then, uh, they've been working this for at least a year, and um, well, here are uh, some interesting facts. They have over 3,000 engineers working in the engine. 80% of users don't pay anything for it. Their ad service subsidizes engine development. A year ago, the runtime fee was off the table because it was hard to implement, but then things were changed with mobile advertising getting less relevant because of app store privacy changes and uh, layoffs and hiring freezes, meaning less licenses were being bought overall. And uh, this is essentially the why Unity wants to change. I think we can also of understand that they want to do some change, but it's the decisions about how it was implemented, how it was communicated, and when it was going to take effect, that is what the developers are particularly angry about. That this is essentially just being sprung on you um, with very little warning. It's basically them just saying, hey, we're unilaterally changing the deal and that's that, which is uh, not cool. I think especially because of the way that the thresholds were applying retroactively. So, how is this actually going to impact games then? Let's let's talk about that because game developers have talked. So, Slay the Spires developer Megacrit Games say that unless there's a full rollback, they will be changing engines for their development follow-up. They also castigate Unity because, quote, we have never made a public statement before. This is how badly you d up. Gary Newman, of course, of Gary's Mod and Rust has already decided it's over, and Rust 2 definitely won't be a Unity game. We have Inner Sloth, the Among Us devs, have told IGN that temporarily delisting the game is an option on the table while they switch engines. The Human Fall Flat developers No Breaks Games are currently questioning whether they can keep developing using the engine. Uh, so yeah, so doubt and fear are very much the watchwords of the day. Many devs are starting to weigh up the costs of uh, of an engine change, of retraining staff, and uh, dealing with any potential costs there, because that's hard. And I think Mike Bithell, once again, coming in with a very uh, wise take, hey devs, consider factoring in engine retraining time for your team into your upcoming budgets. I expect indie publishers are already privately discussing their strategy here, but I wouldn't be shocked if some transparently makes space for this when booking next projects. Projects. That certainly is interesting. At the very least, I know that quite a lot of publishers are trying to speak to Unity right now. So there you have it. Doubt and fear. I think for me, the, the part of this is just crazy is like, come on, guys. How on earth are you doing this when you don't even know how it's going to be implemented? Um, I mean, I'm sure they I'm sure they know. I'm sure they're working towards a solution, but that it doesn't seem to be finished in such a way that they can very transparently say how it works. That is, uh, that is just not good enough. That's not the sort of behavior that I expect. But then again, are we that important? That's the thing. Uh, in many ways, this is a literal loss. Um, I mean, like for, for a game, you know, let me double check. Yes, so Pale Beyond, um, you know, 16 pounds and 75 pence. Uh, now, this could be interesting in the waterfall because we lose 30% of that. And then we lose, um, you know, there's obviously publisher recoup split, all of that stuff. Um, then we will lose whatever the install fee is. Um, but of course, you know, tax, uh, you know, so it's 21%, uh, you know, corporate income tax. So like, you see that £16.75 kind of does get slashed to bits by the end. <laughs> That's just the way that it is. Like it's games. It is a, even in premium. And the, the business of video, video games is a volume one. Um, so this certainly would sting. It would not sting that bad uh, for many devs if they are being honest uh with um you know like reporting in their sales um this could be cheaper than giving unreal your five percent now ish it depends like as an example if i go over here to unreal all right um their standard license is uh it is free to get started free to download and use in many cases and they have an faq for when their royalties uh you know apply 
And that's pretty much that. Now, they do have the Enterprise program. This costs $1,500 uh, per seat per year. Um, that includes, you know, uh, you get like all engine features for everything, but you do get premium support, options for private uh, training, some additional procurement options. And they say that this is best for uh, like enterprise orgs, a specific legal business procurement, technical needs. I mean, I don't know if you're, let's say, using Unreal Engine for a government contract or like a contract with, I don't know, like the military or something, you probably want that. And then of course there is the custom license. For this one, they say that it's for game development professionals and studio seeking. Uh, premium support, um, private training, or custom licensing terms. What this will quite often be is source code access. So if you are a very, very, very large developer, you know, actually making AAA games, you'll probably be on that custom license. But for everybody else, be on the standard license, it will be free. You'll give uh, Unreal 5% of your gross, like above a million dollars. And that's just that. Over in Unity though, well, things do get a little bit more interesting. So for students and hobbyists, they've got their student plan and they've got their personal plan uh, as well. Personal is just the latest version of the core Unity platform. And your eligibility here is revenue or funding less than 100K in the last 12 months. Um, so as an example, for um, for our team, we are on like Unity Pro, um, which yes, 1877. Uh, a year per seat. So yes, it is more expensive um, than Unreal, but there is, it's royalty free, but it's more expensive. So then it'll depend how many seats are you paying for? Um, you know, whether like one engine will be more expensive uh, than the other, because Unity is going to be more expensive if you're like a bit of a smaller game project and you're using a few seats and then you're paying the runtime fee. Whereas, you know, if, if you're an indie game and you sell like 900 grand of revenue, Tim Sweeney's like, I'm dabbing with my Fortnite bananas over here. I don't need any money. Our engine team's got everything they need. So it's interesting from the perspective of uh, competition. But finally, there is Godot. And for Godot, I need to go to the humble bundle. Now, what's funny is that over in Humble, there actually was an already active uh, bundle here for Unity that has sold 2,460 uh, copies. This is basically just game development resources. Uh, what we do have here, though, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit newer, um, but uh, yes, 600 sold, and this is a full introduction to Godot. Uh, Godot is a open source engine. It's, oh, it's, a, it's actually a pretty interesting history. It was was it Brazil? I don't want to get that wrong. I think it was started by two coders in Brazil. It was definitely a Latin American country, though. Um, anyway, and, you know, things went on. It's uh, it's pretty awesome, actually. It's really, really damn good for 2D. You can do 3D as well. I haven't personally looked into it as much, but I do think it's, uh, you know, quite nice here that here's a whole bunch of resources and stuff to get you started in Godot. Pretty damn uh, well-timed, all things considered. So let me know if you're a fellow game developer. What are, what are you doing um, on this? I mean, if... Like, if you're in the premium PC space, for, for me, it's like, what it would cost me in cash flow is to, to do an engine change. It's going to be more, right? It's just, it's just going to be more than, um, you know, what, what I would save by moving to another engine. It's just as simple as that. Like, it takes time to retrain employees, and uh, that's not particularly something we're going to be able... Uh, to uh, to afford the existing skills are in Unity. We've we're already you know we're we're months into a new project in Unity. All the tools that we've built they're in Unity, and that's one of the things with game engines. Like it's it's sticky, you know. Um, it's like video editors, you know, moving from Premiere Pro to Resolve. A lot of people are going to say, hey, go, go to Resolve. I mean, look at that license. You don't have to pay Adobe monthly. How awesome! But here's the thing. I'm a Premiere Pro editor. It's how my brain works. In the same way that you have people who are Final Cut editors and that's how their brain works. It can be pretty damn hard and the cost of making a change can be humongous. Uh, so unless, I, I basically think that unless it's a developer who is either starting a fresh project um, or is in a particularly low revenue per user space. Because like, look, if you're making 50 cents a user, great. Like that can be a really nice scalable model. If Unity starts taking away, um, you know, like say 20% of your revenue, oh dear, that's really quite bad. There's a lot of businesses of 20% of the revenue goes away and uh, now they can't invest in a new thing. Or maybe even if they're already up against the wall, maybe they get wiped out. And uh, at least in the mobile space, like that's often extremely high margin uh, space, but 
as has been mentioned a few times in today's uh, video, recent changes in the App Store have made the uh, the ad market a bit tricky. You may have noticed Facebook getting absolutely irate at Apple for um, what Apple have been doing with changing, like you know, the default, um, like the defaults for trackers, so that you have to opt in. And anyone's going to see that and be like, opt in, uh, you know, do, do I want trackers? No, um, which has wiped out a lot of advertising is kind of interesting. So anyway, I don't know, fellow devs, what are you going to do? You moving to Godot or are you, are you in too deep? I'll say this, I'm in too deep right now. Um, I, I don't think I could uh, really afford to switch, uh, to be honest, um, because even the time that the time that I would spend switching because of the scale of our team, the guy doing the switching is also the guy who's involve you know is doing the rapid prototyping of the new game project and it's like no i need i need that payroll to be going into the actual game moving forward that's where it needs to go right so it's man it's it's hard to move unless um you know you do just have a big old bag of cash man crazy situation anyway that's been it i've rambled for long enough uh thanks to watching thank you to today's sponsor for um perhaps helping uh with our future unity fee um uh, and of course uh helping the team so anyway that's it for me have a great day catch you next time